Happy Easter week, you guys. Thank you so much for joining me on here um, on Lace Up. This week, I'm so, uh, I've been so touched by reading and, okay, this doesn't say it's going. Are you on? Say, say hello if you're on there because this is not showing me anything. Somebody needs to say hello so I can say hello. Hey, I see y'all. Okay, I'm just going to continue. Okay, I've been reading and reading the last, about the last week of Jesus and the last week of Jesus walk on this earth uh, in human form. And I've been just so touched by his goodness, just his goodness. He's so precious. So I just want to jump right on in. Y'all know that you can reach me on here by Messenger or on uh, on Facebook or at kellylace at yahoo.com. And I love it when y'all contact me. I love staying in contact with y'all. I want to get that out of the way quickly because I want to get into this discussion on the the week that the last the last days that Jesus spent on this earth and what all that meant. He spent... His last, of course, he always was pouring into the disciples, but he really just poured into them those last several weeks that he was on the earth. And he foretold many times of his death. He foretold many times of his crucifixion. Um, Y'all, this is distracting having that light coming in, but it's so beautiful coming in. Let me turn so y'all can see that light. That beautiful light, evening light coming in. Let me get over here. Let me get it back where we were. Okay. Let's get back where we were and get focused. He told them many, many times that he was going to be crucified, that he was going to be betrayed, that he was going to be uh, turned over to death. And I don't know, you know, it's almost like they were like, not getting it. He knew that, but he still loved him. They came into Jerusalem on what we know as uh, we call Palm Sunday, the triumphal entry, and all the people out there putting their coats down on the ground so he wouldn't have to, his donkey wouldn't have to walk on dirt and, and Palms. They cut palms off the off the palm trees, and they laid them down so that, uh, as as an honor, like an honorary carpet, as he entered, and they yelled, "Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest!" And they hailed him as who he is. And it was beautiful. But he knew. He knew, that in a very short time, many of those same people would be screaming, crucify him. Still he loved them. Still he loved them. In Matthew 26 and 2, he, it tells us of how he told the disciples in two days, in just two days, Passover will be here and I will be turned over to be crucified. He knew it was coming. That same day, uh, Mary comes in and breaks the alabaster box of oil over his head. He knew that it was symbolic. He knew it was symbolic of his coming crucifixion, of his death. And when the disciples said, that's expensive oil, we could have, we could have sold that to feed the poor. He said, you have the poor with you every day. This was done to anoint me for my burial. That must have disturbed some of them. And yet I wonder, I wonder if Mary knew. I wonder if she had really paid close attention and tuned in in the spirit. Maybe, maybe she knew. Maybe she got it and it didn't fly, do a flyby. Maybe she knew he's about to be killed. And she had the honor of anointing his head with that precious oil. 
anointing him for burial. What a beautiful thing. He knew that it was coming. And still he loved us enough to do it. That night they have what we know as the Last Supper. And he again foretells his crucifixion. And he says that the one that is going to betray him is in their midst. And then he reveals who it is, the one who dips with me, dips his bread with me in the cup. And Judas said, is it me? And he said, yes, we know it's you. And yet, still he loved. He knew he was going to be betrayed, but he didn't berate him or chastise him or talk ugly to him. He just said, you know it's you. It's going to be tough on you. It'd be better for that one that betrays me if they weren't even born. That's what the word says. But I have to know in my heart that he still loved they went to Gethsemane. Well, first he predicts, he predicts Peter's denial. He tells Peter, you're going to deny me three times. And Peter says, no, there's no way. There's no way. I'll never deny you. And he says, yes, you will. But still he loved him. See, he knew he was going to blow it. He knew pressures of life were going to get to him and he was going to mess up big time. Like the ultimate mess up. Denying that he even knew Jesus. That Jesus loved him. I found it interesting that and so touching that right after, let's go back to the Last Supper for a second, right after he reveals that Judas is going to betray him, they continue eating and then he takes that bread, and as he's tearing a piece off, he says, this is symbolic of my body that's going to be broken for you. And this red wine, it's symbolic of my blood that's going to be shed for you. Eat. But remember me. In days to come, remember. When you break this bread and you drink this cup, remember what I'm going to do for you. And when you look back, remember what I did for you. After just revealing that he's going to be betrayed, he knew. He knew it was coming. He predicts Peter's denial, and, and they have this discussion, and he says, you will. But he loved him. They go to Gethsemane. Because you see, Jesus, although he was the son of God. He was also the son of man. He said, the spirit is willing, but my flesh is weak. He didn't want, it wasn't like he was going, okay, now I'm going to go get crucified and beaten and, and tortured. His, his body was going to feel every ounce of pain. His body was going to feel every ounce of pain. So he had to get his head wrapped around. And he cried out to the Father in the garden. It says that he was so stressed. You know how when you're crying really hard, you can feel your pulse in your brain. In your, in your, it's like your brain is just... He agonized to the point, crying out to the Father. But the Word tells us that he sweat great drops of blood, the capillaries in his forehead and in his scalp began to burst. And he sweat drops of blood. That's agony. But he held on. And he pressed through and he said, Please, Father, if there's any other way. Please, I don't want to have to do this. But I will. If that's what you require. And as hard as that had to have been for Father. He said, The wages of sin is death. A sacrificial lamb had to be brought once and for all. And that's who Jesus was for us. That sacrificial lamb. He laid down his life. 
He had that breakthrough to the point that he said, I'll, I'll do it. Not my will, but thine be done. Knowing what was going to happen, he still loved us. They went to the Mount of Olives, and Judas brings the soldiers. And he leans in, this man that he knew and had foretold was going to betray him. This man leans in and kisses him on the cheek and says, Jesus says, friend, why have you come? Friend, do you hear me? Jesus was betrayed by this man to the point of torture and death that he knew was coming. And still he called him friend. That tears me up. Jesus loved through it all. He called him friend. So Jesus is hauled off as if he's a common criminal and he is tried, so-called tried. It wasn't. It was ridiculous. There were false witnesses everywhere, liars. He was mocked. He was beaten, brutally beaten, tortured, really. He knew that in a very short time he would be seated beside God. And do you know the word tells us that he could have called? He could have stopped at any moment and said, Enough. I've had enough. And legions of angels would have come down. The word tells us that they stood swords drawn, ready to come and release him. But he didn't call them. I'm so thankful. I'm so thankful that he did not call. He knew he'd be seated by God and could strike them down at any moment. But still he loved. When he was on that cross, they took him uh, so, so tortured that he had to have someone else carry his cross for him. Simon of Serene. And they get there, they drive those nails through his hands and feet, and they hoist that cross up and drop it in place. And in utter agony, he looks out over the crowd, and you know they had to have been able there, there, there were two, there were several, there were onlookers, just onlookers. And then there were those who were just bloodthirsty, wicked, horrible people. And then there were those who were weeping and mourning and agonizing over his condition, his situation. But he looked out and even over those who were so wicked, crying out, still mocking him, he said, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. They don't understand. How precious. How precious a Savior. I want to, I want to make something really clear. They didn't take his life. Well, yes, in the natural sense, they took his life. But he makes it clear in John 19 and 11. He says, you would have no power over me if it were not given to you from above. He submitted himself to them. To the point of them taking him, beating him, and putting him on that cross. See, he chose to do it for you and me. Well, that's not the end of the story. Aren't you glad? Aren't you glad? Oh, he gives up the ghost, the word tells us. He realizes it's come to that point, and he says, it is finished. In other words, I've done all that needs to be done. All, hear me, all that needs to be done has been done. And he takes his last breath, and he's laid in a tomb. And a few days later, the women come to anoint his body. And that stone has been rolled away. 
roll away. And they see two angels sitting in there where his body would have been. And they say, who are you looking for? Why are you looking for the living among the dead? She doesn't understand. She's confused. She saw him die. And then Jesus appears behind her. And she doesn't, she kind of, I think she kind of glanced and didn't really recognize. The Bible says she didn't recognize it as him. So she couldn't have really looked at him. And, he's, and he speaks with her and then she turns, he says, she doesn't recognize him until he says her name. And he says, Mary. When he said her name, she turned and looked full out on him and fell at his feet. My friend, he knows your name. He knows your name. Whether you're living for him right now or not, he knows your name. And if you will just turn and look full in his face, you will see nothing but love. You see, he doesn't. He doesn't call you to him and then berate you. He doesn't call you to him and then remind you over and over of all that you've done wrong. He knew it all. He knew it all, and still he loved enough to go through all of that for you, for me. I know me, and even today, living for him, I fail, and I fail him, and I think, why do you even waste time loving me sometimes? But it's not wasted time. He invests his time in us. He loves you. He loves me. That stone's been rolled away, and he is risen. He is risen. The price was paid. Don't think that more needs to be done. Don't think that you have to get good enough to come to him. You can't. You can't, because if you were to walk as perfect a life as you could possibly po walk on this earth, it would not be good enough to warrant his love. And yet, he loves you. He is risen. So every time you think about Easter, when you're sitting and you're hearing Sunday services or watching kids gather eggs, <laughs> oh, I should have gotten a tissue, or whatever, when you're thinking about Easter, I want you to think about all of this. I want you to think about it all encapsulated in one, one sentence. He knew. And still he loved. He knew everything you would do. All the mistakes you would make. All of the wrong turns you would take. All of the just point blank bad decisions you'd make. He knew. Still, he loved enough to go through all of that just to be able to call you his. And he looks at you and he says, my friend, my brother, my sister, my friend. He knew and still he loved. I love y'all. Enjoy your Easter week. Enjoy your Easter weekend. And know how much he loves you. I love you too. Not anywhere near like he does. But I do love you. And I pray for you. Anyone who's watching this. Lisa, let's keep on walking. See you next week.